Hey, welcome to Socialism for All. Today's date is January 14, 2022. This weekend, we're doing a whole slew of articles about COVID, different aspects of it, whether it's long COVID or government policy or mass protests, whatever. Anyway, in this article, I'm going to follow up with a story that I covered in an earlier COVID video. The headline of this article is, Rhode Island Healthcare System is Currently Collapsing, Emergency Doctors Warn. No one who is practicing medicine alive in this country right now has ever experienced what we're going through right now, the president of the Rhode Island chapter of the American College of Emergency Physicians told the Boston Globe. This is from about a month ago, December 18, 2021. For anyone outside the U.S., Rhode Island is a state. It's about halfway between New York City and Boston up in the Northeast. The author of this article is Brian Amaral, and yeah, it's from a month ago. So that means really prior to the onset of Omicron and this whole wave of the pandemic where we're getting a million and a half cases in a single day this past Monday. So we're going to read through this article. I kind of just made quick reference to it in the previous video. And then we're going to see if we can update it because it has been about a month and well, now things are even worse. So let's get into the article. So Dateline Providence, Rhode Island hospitals are teetering on the brink of disaster. The association representing emergency doctors warned in a startling letter to the governor and state health department. Quote, any added strain right now will lead to collapse of the state health care system, wrote Dr. Nadine Himmelfarb, the president of the Rhode Island chapter of the American College of Emergency Physicians, in a letter earlier this month. Quote, we, a collective group of emergency physicians, are terrified for the future of health care in this state. In an interview, Himmelfarb, a practicing emergency physician, told the Globe that she wrote the letter to spur the state to more drastic action than it has taken so far. The letter serves as a sobering warning to a pandemic-weary public about the scale of a towering crisis. Nearly two years from the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, emergency departments around Rhode Island are severely understaffed, with some reporting 25 to 50 percent of their nursing positions unfilled. Let me read that again. With some emergency departments around Rhode Island reporting 25 to 50 percent of their nursing positions unfilled. Hospitals are also dealing with shortages of unit secretaries, lab techs, and radiology techs. COVID-19 vaccine requirements did not cause any major hospital system to lose a significant amount of staff, Himmelfarb said. So commenting, People were not quitting over the vaccine requirements. This is burnout. It's people getting sick. It's things like that. The article continues, People are leaving emergency department jobs for complex reasons, including burnout after two pandemic years and low pay even compared to neighboring states. Some nurses have left for lucrative travel jobs that they can do while still living in Rhode Island or for other specialties where they won't suffer from the moral injury of working in a traumatic, dysfunctional system. COVID-19 cases, although they have risen recently, are not the immediate cause of the capacity crisis, Himmelfarb said. Pausing there, just commenting. So again, they're talking here about the Delta wave that was happening in the fall. This is pre-Omicron. So what they're saying is that although, you know, the Delta wave was causing hospitals to run at increased capacity, that's not really the immediate reason for this. It's bigger issues and less acute issues, issues that have kind of built up over time. So continuing, the system is simply too short staffed to deal with the sort of volume it could have handled in the past. But any further COVID surges would be, quote, unmanageable. Comment, what happened right after this? Yeah. Hospitals don't even have enough staff for themselves much less to open field hospitals, like the state did last year. The crisis has led to long wait times and inconsistent standards of care, quote, rationing resources, unable to provide privacy, and certainly unable to provide any COVID-19 isolation precautions, Himmelfarb wrote. It doesn't happen all the time, but hospitals now are unable to consistently provide 
the level of care people are accustomed to in the 21st century United States. Quote, Imagine patients dying while waiting to be seen by a doctor who's 50 feet away and because of lack of staff and thus capacity, simply unable to treat them, Himmelfarb wrote. This is a true tragedy that is currently unfolding for citizens of Rhode Island. She told the Globe, quote, No one who is practicing medicine alive in this country right now has ever experienced what we're going through right now. Himmelfarb, in her Tuesday letter, called on the state to implement a mask mandate. It did so Wednesday, although, as she noted, it only went into effect on Monday, and to impose limits on elective procedures. She also said the National Guard and disaster medical assistance teams could help. The state could also provide subsidies for healthcare workers' salaries to get them to come to Rhode Island, loosen licensing and credentialing criteria, and let professionals work there if they're licensed in another state and provide protection from legal liability when they're working in these sorts of, quote, disaster conditions. But there are no easy solutions to a staffing problem that predates even the coronavirus pandemic in Rhode Island, problems that can be traced to comparatively low Medicaid reimbursements in Rhode Island and, quote, business priorities of the individual medical systems. Like a chronic disease that turns into a dire medical emergency, this chronic problem is leading to system-wide failure in Rhode Island, she said. She added in her letter, quote, the lack of policy and action from the Rhode Island Department of Health and state leadership to address this health care capacity crisis are putting our citizens at risk. Himmelfarb said that the steps taken since the letter, quote, have not yet come to fruition. The lifespan system has said that it's canceling some elective procedures, but there has been no statewide mandate in Rhode Island, unlike in Massachusetts. People should continue to seek care at an emergency department for emergencies, but try other routes for non-emergencies, keeping in mind that, quote, we are in a very tenuous place right now, Himmelfarb said. They should also get vaccines and boosters and wear masks indoors. Quote, everybody needs to do their part, Himmelfarb said. Himmelfarb's organization, the Rhode Island chapter of the American College of Emergency Physicians, represents 250 emergency physicians at 11 emergency departments in the state. She said that Governor Dan McKee's office and the health department have not yet responded directly to her letter. Her account lines up with what emergency doctors and nurses have been warning for weeks, warnings that have only escalated recently. People are suffering and dying because they can't get the care they need when they need it. Confidential internal Department of Health documents obtained by the Globe revealed that the state's busiest emergency departments are considered, quote, dangerously overcrowded. The healthcare system uses a score called NEDOCS, NEDOCS, to measure overcrowding, from a scale that goes up to 200. Several hospitals have been consistently at 200, and the state's largest, Rhode Island Hospital, was most recently at 198. Anything over 180 is considered, quote, dangerously overcrowded. The crisis is playing out not just in emergency departments, but across the healthcare system, which is suffering from a lack of everything from ambulance crews to nursing home staff. Emergency departments, though, are considered the front door of a hospital. It's where crises often come first. Quote, we are, one could say, the canary in the coal mine of healthcare, Himmelfarb wrote and our state health care system is currently collapsing. So there's the letter here that Himmelfarb signed as president of the American College of Emergency Physicians, Rhode Island chapter. I'll put that on the screen now if you want to just try to pause it and read it. Otherwise, I'll put the link to that in the description below. But actually, right now, I want to switch to a follow-up article. This is from today, January 14. So month later follow-up. Basically, this is an article from the Providence Journal by G. Wayne Miller, again, January 14, 2022. Headline is, A Message from Nurses and Doctors Inside the ICU. Rhode Island's Hospital Staffing is in Crisis. So, yeah, things didn't really improve over the month in question. By the way, before we get into the article, there's a not-that-related video here titled, Dr. Worrisome Variants Could Follow Omicron. Scientists warn that Omicron's rapid spread across the globe 
practically ensures that it won't be the last worrisome coronavirus variant. So why? Because every time that the virus multiplies, there can be DNA errors and, well, mutations. A lot of mutations don't matter, but some can confer advantage. You don't want the virus to just multiply. And unfortunately, that's what Omicron is really good at. It's highly transmissible, which means it just reproduces and reproduces and reproduces. Anyway, um, let's get into this article. During her rotations through Kent Hospital's intensive care unit, where COVID patients in dire condition are treated, nurse Trish Kreiner experiences challenges that sorely test the fortitude she's built in three decades in her profession. Quote, it's completely exhausting, she told the journal on Monday. Bolstered by her days off, Kreiner perseveres, but the pandemic's relentless onslaught has driven many healthcare professionals from employment at Kent and other hospitals statewide. Combined with absences when staff members are sick with COVID or other illnesses, the net effect has been severe staff shortages that have forced some hospitals to curtail services, with some incurring significant financial burdens. Quote, From the very beginning, there were people that pretty much ran, said Kreiner. Quote, they went on a leave of absence and some never came back. Then there were a lot of people retiring. They thought, you know what? It's time. I can't go through this. Other people became burnt out, looked for different avenues of nursing, and you saw the numbers trickle and trickle down. You didn't realize it over time, but then, two years later, half the staff is gone, unquote. Kreiner, president of United Nurses and Allied Professionals Local 5008, added, quote, It's frustrating. We're in the second year now, and it doesn't seem to be letting up. We thought maybe once the vaccines came into the picture that it would make things better, and then it didn't. We have another wave, and staff is dropping like flies, unquote. Kent Hospital juggling staff, hiring temps amid nursing shortage. Dr. James E. Fanal did not use that analogy during a recent interview with the journal, but the president and CEO of Care New England, which owns Kent, Butler, and Women and Infants Hospitals, spoke in stark terms of the extreme pressures on his healthcare system, the state's largest, during the latest pandemic surge. Staffing is short at all CNE hospitals, Fennell said, but, quote, a big, big challenge is Kent because it's a medical surgical hospital, and we're down, depending on what you measure, 30 to 40 percent vacancies in nursing. In the ER, we're at about a 40 plus percent vacancy in nursing positions, unquote. Can I just add that picture of him there? Looks like a 19th century illustration. (laughs) How is that guy real? Okay, anyway, continuing. Staff who have contracted COVID or the flu cannot work until they recover. And this has contributed to the situation not only at Kent, but also Butler. Women and infants has been similarly affected, according to the CEO. Quote, the labor and delivery staff is more strained, he said. We don't have all units open. According to Fennell, most elective surgery requiring a post-operative stay at Kent has been suspended, a shift that has resulted in lost revenues. Quote, on a week-to-week basis, we're just canceling them, he said. We're now moving to postponing other day cases, the ones that come in and out in a few hours, because we need the staff to cover the rest of the hospital, unquote. That coverage, Fennell said, also involves, quote, flexibility to move staff around from one location to another, different staffing models. For example, looking at non-clinical staff who can assist clinical staff, unquote. Kind of reminds me of a comic I was looking at recently, which is like, uh, you know, there's somebody assisting a patient in a bed and the patient's saying, how long have you been a nurse? And the guy's saying, nurse, I work in the cafeteria. Anyway, like other hospitals in Rhode Island, Kent uses nurses from so-called travel agencies to fill gaps, but that comes at a price, and not just financially, according to Fennell. Quote, they cost us three to four times what a normal nurse costs, he said. If it's costing us $50 an hour for our own nurses, it's costing 150 plus for an agency nurse. And that's pretty challenging financially. More importantly, it's really not fair to our stable, terrific nursing staff to work alongside somebody else doing the same work. But that's where we are. That's the state across the region. I'd rather not use any of them. I'd rather reward our own staff, but I just can't. Right now, we are using dozens of them because we have to. We can't burden our own staff with burnout. 
They're already working extra hours. We just can't cover it all without hiring these agency nurses, unquote. In his interactions with staff, Fennell seeks to bolster morale. And can I just say, I hope, I'm not sure if they um, interview staff about Fennell, but it'd be interesting to sort of like fact check this uh, or get an opposing view from the worker side. But anyway, continuing, we've got to keep everybody resilient, he said. We've got to keep everybody together. We probably have several, <laughs> several more weeks until this goes away. Yeah, I think that's a safe bet. Uh, but the good news about the Omicron variant is it is going to peak and go away, unquote. Well, clearly you hope so, but uh, we'll see. A bird's eye view of COVID stresses at Rhode Island Hospital. Vaccines were not available when nurse Helene Macedo contracted coronavirus disease in October 2020. She left her job at Rhode Island Hospital, and during her recovery from the acute phase of the disease, she began to experience symptoms of long-haul COVID. Quote, I was having cardiac issues, cognitive impairment, extreme fatigue, Macedo said in an interview on Monday. Everything just kept evolving. It wasn't until July of 2021 that I was clear to start to try to come back to work. Let's pause there. She got sick in October 2020. She couldn't go back to work until July 2021. That's nine months. So you see, there's this idea of like, let's let Omicron rip and it'll build up natural immunity. We're two years into this thing. We're entering calendar year three. And they think that herd immunity is going to work. It's not. It's not going to work. You have to try to control the spread. But that involves you know, redirecting commerce and other things, and they're not willing to do that. So you get just this empty hope that, you know, failed strategies that were proved wrong in 2020, they're just going to keep trotting them back out again. No, what you're going to do is disable a lot of people, and then there will be no one to work anywhere in the economy. Everywhere will be trying to hobble by with 50% of its staff. That suicidal policy, I mean, let alone the fact that she wasn't able to work, but I mean, also, that's almost a year of her life that she wasn't able probably to do much of anything else. All right, anyway. Continuing, when she did, quote, I came back as a case manager, not really doing my technical full duties, Macedo said. I was just doing pieces of my assignment and was only barely lasting four hours a day. Since July, I've gradually been increasing the amount of time that I'm able to stay to about five and a half hours, starting to have a little more of my case management responsibilities, but still on a limited basis. So Macedo has a bird's eye view of the challenges facing Rhode Island Hospital. Quote, the impact of staffing shortages is definitely making it more difficult to do our job, she said. I've been a nurse since 1985. I haven't ever seen anything like this. Price gouging by temporary staffing agencies. Neither has Timothy J. Babineau, president and CEO of Lifespan, the state's largest healthcare system. Lifespan operates Rhode Island, Bradley, Newport, the Miriam, and Hasbro Children's Hospitals, and several urgent care and other centers. In an interview on Monday, Babineau described service curtailments similar to those outlined by Fennell, with whom he is in regular communication, not only regarding the pandemic, but also the proposed merger of CNE and Lifespan with Brown University as the academic partner. The first of two public hearings on the proposal will be on January 20. Like Fennell, Babineau and his team have shifted schedules and redeployed staff in order to maintain essential services including in intensive care units and emergency departments. And like Care New England, Lifespan has been forced to hire travel nurses. Babineau doesn't fault those who take these jobs, but he is critical of what agencies have done during COVID. Quote, it's hard to fault the individual, Babineau said. If I can make three times as much, it's hard to blame them. It's the staffing agencies. We've got the congressional delegation's attention. This has to be a national solution. It can't just be a Rhode Island solution. If it was any other crisis and people started price gouging on gasoline or price gouging on milk, the Congress would step in and say, hey, knock it off. This is the exact same thing, unquote. 
you know, just a comment there. Isn't it funny that somebody who operates all these, you know, healthcare systems is really concerned about economic justice? You know, in the United States, the country with the most fucked up for profit healthcare system in the world, which charges how much for supplies and you know, fairly routine procedures, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Insulin, basic life-giving medicine needed by many. No, but when it comes to his payroll, fucking better crack down. Amazing. Just the hypocrisy. It's astounding. Juggling resources to preserve emergency care. Babineau acknowledged that wait times at Rhode Island Hospital's emergency department, quote, are longer for the semi-urgent things, the things that you'd like to start taking care of within an hour, and now may take a couple hours. You know, I think that uh, things you'd like to take care of within an hour are a little more than semi-urgent, anyway. State health care leaders have repeatedly advised individuals with non-life-threatening conditions to visit urgent care centers or their physicians when possible. Quote, We're working really, really hard to try to maintain the services that Rhode Island Hospital uniquely provides, Babineau said. That has required shifting some resources around to make sure that, God forbid, when there is a car accident, when there's a stroke, when there's a heart attack, that we've got people in the emergency department that can take care of that. But he added, I'll be honest with you, it's tenuous. We'll see what the next couple of weeks bring. That's something that's keeping me up at night right now. The constant daily challenge to deliver the emergent care that only Rhode Island Hospital can provide. The hospital is the region's only level one trauma center. In his interactions with staff, Babineau has said he stopped using the word unprecedented to describe the pandemic soon to enter its third year. Instead, he asks employees to imagine the future when the passage of time will have allowed perspective that may be elusive or impossible now in what he calls, quote, this historic moment. During a recent town hall, Babineau said, quote, I basically thanked the staff that are still sticking with us. I said, you're continuing to answer the call. I understand some of your colleagues that, for their own reasons, had to step away, and we understand that. But for those of you that are still with us, appreciate the role you're playing in your generation's war. Time out. Um, Probably they just have no other financial options, but okay. Anyway, your generation's war. This guy, I swear to God, somebody needs to sit this guy down and, like, get some reality into his head. Continuing, I guarantee you a couple of years from now, if you stick with us, you will have an enormous pride, a professional purpose, given what you're doing today, and I appreciate that. I know it's hard, and you're tired of being told it's hard, but I'm trying to shift the thinking to something bigger than the virus, unquote. Yeah, commenting, and, you know, by the way, as soon as he needs to lay you off, he will. Anyway, nursing shortage opens up some really cool jobs. I say, I appreciate, I guess, the attempt at a positive spin, but after everything else. Really cool jobs, I think, is probably the last thing most people are thinking about. All right. Dr. Brian K. Alverson, director of the Division of Pediatric Hospital Medicine at Hasbro, is among those who are still answering the call. Quote, we have seen an uptick in hospitalizations of children with COVID, Alverson said on Monday evening. But I want to be clear. It's children. Oh, God. So here's the new face of COVID denial. With COVID, not because of COVID? Yeah, no. This is the new pre-existing conditions. It is COVID denial, period. Continuing. What we're seeing is kids who are coming in for whatever they come in with who also happen to have COVID. Today I saw about 20 patients. I would say about eight had COVID and none of them were particularly sick. Okay, so I wasn't there. I don't know how sick they were. I can't say. What we do know is we're seeing, for example, like maybe a 2.5 fold increase in diabetes in children who had COVID. So contracting this virus, like, for example, the Epstein-Barr virus is associated. If you get infected with that, it's associated with increased risk of getting multiple sclerosis. So being infected with viruses can cause other conditions, sometimes in ways we don't fully understand. But it seems like COVID can cause diabetes or like increase your odds of getting diabetes, particularly in children. 
So anyway, you know, this focus on acute symptoms, whatever they are, the severity and intensity of the acute symptoms, uh, misleading at best. Anyway, continuing. Hasbro Children's has not been spared staffing issues, Alverson said. Quote, we do feel short-staffed, especially nursing on the wards, because when we're full, often that means that there's an empty bed rather than no more beds. The problem is, we just don't have any more nurses to staff those beds, which I think relates to a lot of people not being able to help handle their childcare and things like that. Yeah, I mean, almost like this entire system top to bottom is dysfunctional. On Tuesday afternoon, the Lifespan, get ready, the Lifespan job site listed 474 system-wide openings for full-time nurses. <laughs> That's a lot of openings. Alverson prefers to dwell on the possibilities, not the pessimisms, that the pandemic has brought. Quote, because of short staffing, this is a great opportunity for, I can't wait for this one, this is a great opportunity for a lot of young people who are looking for nursing jobs to get really cool jobs and move in quickly and be able to probably advance faster in their careers than they would have otherwise, he said. <laughs> Never mind the piles of dead bodies at your ankles. <laughs> Just think about career opportunities. All right. In his division, the doctor said, quote, we had two new openings this year for nurse practitioners, and those jobs filled up within a week of posting because everyone wants to be an inpatient pediatric nurse practitioner. It's a really cool gig, and it's very hard to come by. Those opportunities would not have existed had it not been for COVID. So commenting again, do you know how overloaded many practitioners are with just having, like, way more patients than they can possibly really give attention to? What I'm trying to say is there could be openings for many more practitioners, and then patients would get better care because practitioners wouldn't be spread so thin. It's the fucking cheapskate healthcare practices in many cases which use practices, you know, they don't want to hire more practitioners. So where, you know, that status quo of like, there's not enough openings, you know, you can't get the good jobs or advance, this could be changed with a different overall system. Anyway, continuing. From the ICU... An urgent message for the public. Kent Hospital's Trish Kreiner sees possible short-term solutions to hospital staffing shortages in such band-aids as the National Guard and assistance from the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, which Governor Dan McKee has requested. McKee on Wednesday also announced that he is sending about 60 National Guard troops to Butler. Other hospitals will now be able to transfer patients there who primarily need behavioral health care which will free up beds in acute care settings. On Thursday, President Joe Biden announced that a military medical team would be dispatched to Rhode Island Hospital to help treat COVID patients there. Totally normal. Travel nurses also provide some relief, Kreiner said, quote, but that's a temporary fix because eventually their contract ends and they go home, and obviously the hospitals can't keep paying that amount of money or they'd all go broke. Longer term, quote, more investment in the nursing schools, more teachers in the nursing schools, more investment in all aspects of health care, she said. Comment again, uh, what's going on with nursing school right now? It's a pandemic. Do student nurses have to go out and do clinicals in very unsafe environments as far as getting COVID? You bet. Are they getting paid to do that? No, they are paying to do that. So... <laughs> Is that, uh, I mean, there have been nursing shortages on and off for a long time, maybe just on. I'm not even sure if, like, if the uh, nursing shortage ever went off, really. This has been going on for decades now. And, uh, you know, the system treats its staff really as expendable. Um, and that starts in the schools, in the training. And, uh, you know, I think it's going to be real interesting. So many people are leaving healthcare right now. And, uh, you know, how are they going to repopulate, uh, particularly if this pandemic drags on for several more years, which it likely will, given that, you know, the U.S. is just, like, not doing anything to really contain it. Raises a lot of questions I honestly am not even prepared to try to wrap my head around as I'm sitting here doing this story. But it's, 
it's like just staring into a yawning abyss. It's, it's, I find it disturbing to contemplate these things. All right. Meanwhile, this intensive care nurse who has witnessed so much suffering and death firsthand has a message for the public. Quote, I would like to urge everyone to get vaccinations, Kreiner told the journal. In the ICU, 90% or more of the patients suffering with COVID and have a poor prognosis aren't vaccinated. By alleviating some of the critical outcomes of the disease, it will help to relieve some of the strain placed on the hospitals and also help us to ensure that there is a bed and a staff to care for all patients. So that's the end of the article. Um, you have there a healthcare system operating, you know, 50, 60 percent uh, of capacity. And again, you know, the guy's like, uh, oh, yeah, Omicron's going to peak and then be gone. Yeah, well, let's even say that it is. And, you know, when we talk about Omicron peaking, it's currently like triple or quadruple what it was last winter. And, you know, yes, there's vaccines. And yes, uh, percentage wise, fewer people who get Omicron are going to wind up in the hospital versus last winter, etc. due to various factors. But overall, it's so contagious and so many more people are getting it that even if fewer people per capita wind up hospitalized, so many more people are infected that you still net wind up with a greater number of people. That's why we're having record hospitalizations, including pediatric hospitalizations. And the hospitals can't keep up and the U.S. is sending in the military. And yet there's still no focus on structural fixes, just vaccines, personal behavior. In fact, Dr. Eric Feigl-Ding, epidemiologist I follow on Twitter, highly recommend, does a lot of interesting tweets, was just reporting that Rochelle Walensky, the head of the CDC, flat out refused to not just mandate, but recommend N95 masks. What can you do with that? I mean, what can you do? When the government, which is supposed to be, you know, uh, setting the ground rules of the overall system, is just simply refusing to do the bare minimum. I mean, the time is just more ripe than ever for socialist agitation, education, and organizing. Clearly, this government in the United States is, I mean, even as capitalist governments and their capacity to care about the well-being of the working class is concerned, uh, you know, and as far as that can be stretched, you know, they just can't be bothered. They really just can't be bothered. I think that following this winter of death, uh, we need a summer of rage this year. We need to make 2020 look like a walk in the park, pull more people into the movement for building proletarian power, and, uh, I don't know. It's just, uh, I got to say, I mean, winter's a tough time. It's cold. It's dark. It's dreary. Um, this sucks. I mean, this is just, uh, there's a lot happening right now. Almost all of it bad. Uh, but we do need to remember, you know, spring will come, summer will come. And we need to start laying the groundwork and making plans for that now. I get that there's a lot of shattering news hitting right now. Um, really, c kind of too much to keep up with. Uh, sometimes, you know, I'll uh, you know read the news in the morning and whatever. There is so much happening this week, uh, whether it's with COVID, student walkouts, and again, we'll be doing different videos on a lot of these different topics. Um, but, I mean, you know, possibility of war with Russia, all kinds of things happening. Uh, Chinese ports closing. <laughs> Really, really intense week, um, and yeah, just, you know, hard to stay afloat. I personally just had some plans impacted by all this that hit pretty deep, so uh, rough time, you know, solidarity with everybody else out there struggling. But about this article, what do you think? Uh, do you have any experiences? Do you work in this field? Do you have friends who do? Tell your stories below. Um, it's always interesting to read that. And I think that people sharing their stories, you know, others can see that we're not alone. And although things are pretty bleak, um, it can just help to remember that 
we are all in this together. Uh, not with the capitalists, of course, but class-wise, you know, we have a set of common interests and we do need to support each other in that. All right. I'll leave it there for now. Thanks for listening. Thanks to the current patrons whose names are on the screen. If you'd like to get your name on the screen, head to patreon.com slash socialism for all. You can sign up for as little as $2 a month. Every donation is encouraging. They're also materially helpful, so I really appreciate everyone who has signed up to do that a lot. If you'd like to help out without making a donation, hit like, subscribe, leave a comment, even if it's just thanks or good video. All that helps to boost the channel, as does sharing it on your social media. All of that helps to build the channel, pull more people into this conversation, and expand class consciousness. We need to do that. Otherwise, back in the real world, join an organization or make a contribution to one if you're not ready to join yet. People ask me sometimes for recommendations on organizations. I suggest looking for something in your area that's doing useful work that you'd like to be a part of. Also, one that responds fairly promptly when you contact them and generally seems like they know what they're doing. Uh, joining an organization that is dysfunctional or struggling can be a real drain on your life unless you really feel motivated to help build it. Uh, I'd say just look for you know whatever seems to be like a healthy group and that is doing the kind of work that you're interested in or start a project of your own if you have an idea and the comrades and the resources to get it started. We always love seeing new projects pop up. The world needs good news and people to bring it into the world. I'm going to leave it there. Thanks again, and we'll catch you in the next video.